Let me add my Mother's Day greeting to all the moms here. And uh, I want to tell you that normally on special days like Mother's Day, Father's Day, uh, we want to emphasize the holiday like we did this morning, especially having the children lead us in worship. But I tend to stick with what my series is, and that's what we're going to do today. So turn your Bibles to Acts chapter 9. We're continuing our study through what we're calling Luke volume 2, also known as the book of Acts. Now, some of us might have Bibles that are a little bit older, maybe some of the more traditional Bibles. And if you look at the beginning of the book of Acts, what the title will be is the Acts of the Apostles. Uh, That's not really accurate. And that's why uh, a lot of the more modern Bibles, if you look at the front cover of of the book of Acts, it'll just say Acts. Because really, it's not just the acts of the apostles, it's, it's really the acts of the Holy Spirit through the first century church. Now, when we look at the acts of the Holy Spirit in the first century church, sometimes it creates confusion. Sometimes it creates questions in the 21st century church. For instance, you may often think, what am I supposed to do with all these miracles? How do the signs and wonders that are performed repeatedly in the first century church, how do they apply to me in 21st century America? Well, I'm sure you've heard what Thomas Jefferson did. If you go to the Smithsonian, you could see the Jeffersonian Bible. I've got the title page there. This is actual, true, in the Smithsonian, the life and morals, that's key, the life and morals of Jesus of Nazareth extracted textually from the Gospels. Well, folks, let me tell you, it's extracted all right. Okay, what's extracted is all the morality that Jesus teaches and none of the miracles that he performed. Jefferson just got rid of them. You see, he didn't believe Jesus was God. He didn't believe that Jesus performed miracles. As a matter of fact, the Jeffersonian Bible ends with the death of Jesus, and there is no resurrection. I spent uh, quite a bit of time this past week in Washington, D.C. I was working with an organization. We were talking to senators and representatives about taking care of the diseased in sub-Sahara Africa taking care of the poor, uh, using just 1% of the federal budget to try to take care of foreign aid. As I landed at Reagan Airport and then uh, took an Uber uh, into D.C., uh, we were able to pass the Jefferson Memorial. Uh, We passed the Washington Monument. It made me think about the founding fathers of our country, many of whom believed just like Jefferson. I know as Christians, we've been probably taught many things about the founding fathers, but there's an excellent book that has just been written, probably the best scholarly work on the faith of our founding fathers that has ever been done. I've got a picture of it. It's by Greg Frazier. It's called The Religious Beliefs of America's Founders. This guy's an evangelical. He is respected by other evangelical church historians, and you might be shocked at what he reveals. Here's sort of a summary statement. The Gospel Coalition interviewed him, and this was his statement. They, most of the Founding Fathers, believed that morality was indispensable for a free society. That's why Jefferson's Bible was called the life and morals of Jesus. Religion, they found, was the best source for morality. Most, however, didn't even believe the religion needed for this purpose was Christianity. He goes on to say that most of the founding fathers borrowed heavily from the Christian faith as regards morality, but they believed more along the lines of what we would call natural religion. In other words, morality derived from human reason and not divine revelation. Because they spoke about Christianity, you can take their comments out of context and make them sound like Christians, but very few of them actually were, and very few actually had any intention of creating a Christian country. So we can simply be thankful to God that by His grace and not by their intent, 
Christianity was, has flourished in our country. Now, why do I bring all this up? Because it is so relevant to life in the 21st century. Because so many people believe as most of our founding fathers did. They like the morality of Christianity. But dealing with miracles, especially the miracles of Christ, well, that would force them to come to grips with the fact that Jesus was God. And people don't like the idea of Jesus being God and being the only way that we can know God. But regardless of whether you agree with the Founding Fathers or with culture, the question before the house this morning is this. If the miracles in the book of Acts are God's inspired word, what is that message to those of us this morning who actually know Christ? What are we supposed to do with the supernatural? What are we supposed to do with the signs and wonders that permeate the book of Acts? Well, I hope to answer that question this morning. Let's all stand out of reverence for God's Word. I'm going to read Acts chapter 9, verses 31 to 43, and I would submit to you that one of the greatest miracles that has ever been performed is what you hopefully hold in your hands and what I'm about to read, and that is the inspired, inerrant Word of God. So the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria had peace. And was being built up. And walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, it multiplied. Now, as Peter went here and there among them all, he came down also to the saints who lived at Lydda. There he found a man named Aeneas, bedridden for eight years, who was paralyzed. And Peter said to him, Aeneas, Jesus Christ heals you. Rise and make your bed. And immediately he rose. And all the residents of Lydda and Sharon saw him, and they turned to the Lord. Now there was in Joppa a disciple named Tabitha, which translated means Dorcas. She was full of good works and acts of charity. In those days she became ill and died, and when they had washed her, they laid her in an upper room. Since Lydda was near Joppa, the disciples, hearing that Peter was there, sent two men to him, urging him, Please come to us without delay. So Peter rose and went with them. And when he arrived, they took him to the upper room. All the widows stood beside him weeping and showing tunics and other garments that Dorcas made while she was with them. But Peter put them all outside and knelt down and prayed. And turning to the body, he said, Tabitha, arise. And she opened her eyes. And when she saw Peter, she sat up. And he gave her his hand and raised her up. Then calling the saints and widows, he presented her alive. And it became known throughout all Joppa, and many believed in the Lord. And he stayed in Joppa for many days with one Simon, a tanner. May God bless the hearing and teaching of his inspired, infallible, inerrant, and authoritative word. Dear flock of God, this is God's word. It is miraculous that we have access to it. And he's given it to us so that he might raise our minds above what we see and lead us to trust that he is the miraculous God. Let's pray. Father, would you enable us to have eyes that see and ears that hear Holy Spirit, come and be near. In Jesus' name, amen. Go ahead and have a seat. <clears throat> so, three things we can learn from this passage about how the miraculous touches our lives in the 21st century. At Oak Mountain, uh, we teach that we can experience the miraculous power of God by waltzing. A waltz is a three-step dance, and the three-step waltz that enables us to experience supernatural, transforming power is repent, believe, fight. Repent, believe, fight. So the first lesson that we learned this morning is to repent deeply of functional deism. Repent deeply of functional deism. If you don't know what deism is, 
A good way to define it or describe it would be that deism is the belief that God created the world like a watchmaker creates a watch. And once the watch is made, it is simply left to do what it was created to do by the parts working. The watchmaker is no longer involved in the process. Deism is the belief that God the Creator created the world, set up natural laws, and now He His hands off. Now the world just runs according to natural laws. And many of our founding fathers were, in fact, deists. Some of them were not. Some of them believed in providence. Some of them believed that God was, in fact, involved. Some of them believed that we should even be people of prayer. But not many of them believed the miracles of Jesus because they did not believe that Jesus was God. Now, I know that most of us here do believe Jesus was God, but we're still left with how do we live? Do we, do we say we believe that God is the God of the miraculous, but live functionally day by day as if God was not the God of the miraculous? Well, Luke writes this account to bring us face to face with the miraculous power of God. Look at verse 34. Peter says to Aeneas, Jesus Christ heals you. And this isn't the first time we come across healings in the book of Acts. In Acts chapter 3, Peter and John are going up to the temple at the time of prayer. There's a man laying there who was lame. And Peter says, silver and gold I don't have, but what I have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. The miraculous was so present in the first century church that we're told in Acts chapter 5 that people would bring the sick out on the streets so that even the shadow of Peter would fall upon them. And the shadow of Peter falling upon the sick brought them healing. What do you do with that? What place does the miraculous and the supernatural have in your daily life? There's ways to see whether or not we live as functional deists, even if we say we believe in miracles. Look at verse 36. Tabitha, or Dorcas, which means deer or gazelle, she died, and they washed her body. Now, I learned this week in my study that, that a warm water bath for someone who has died was what we would almost consider ancient CPR. They were hoping that the warm water would get the blood flowing again and that life would return to the body. Now, there's nothing wrong with trusting in medicine. There's nothing wrong, of course, uh, learning from God's common grace what we can learn about healing physically using medicines. We should, as Christians, make use of that. But my encouragement to us this morning is this. When you are sick, when you are wrestling with sin, when you are struggling with addiction, do you simply tackle it with human willpower? Do you simply go after it using natural laws? then you're living as a functional deist. Dorcas was a woman who uh, made clothes for widows. It, it says that uh, in verse 36. She, she was full of charity. And in verse 39, we find out it was for widows. And it's very likely that Dorcas herself was a widow. Now, you need to understand, in the first century, if you were a widow, if you did not have a husband, then you were in tough circumstances because all of the help to a woman usually came through a man and if it wasn't a husband it was going to be a father if the father was dead and you were not married you were in trouble financially but Dorcas didn't just give the miraculous lip service she wasn't a functional deist she actually stepped out and gave acts of charity when she had nothing one of the ways for you to ask yourself, am I a functional deist, is do you trust God to miraculously provide for you and then engage in surprising generosity? Look, if you're more concerned about your retirement, your 401k, or your lifestyle 
and that is keeping you from surprising generosity, you might say you believe in the miraculous, but you're actually living as a functional deist. You're not trusting God to be engaged in your world and to provide for you or to miraculously change you so that you're content with less than what you think. In verse 40, uh, Peter puts them all outside. He kneels down and prays. He prays for the supernatural. Matter of fact, all through the book of Acts, the church prays that God would extend his hand through signs and wonders. Another sign that you're engaging in functional deism is prayerlessness. Look, I've confessed to you all many times that, that I am so prone to trust in hours of study rather than in prayer. I am so prone to trust in my preparation time than I am in prayer. And that is a sign of functional deism. I say I believe in the miraculous, but I don't trust the miraculous power of the Spirit through the miraculous inspiration of the Scriptures to bring you life. I feel it so often up to me. And that's true, by the way, of all of y'all's vaca- vocations. Okay? It's not just the pastor that, that needs to pray about their vocation. What if you're a doctor? Are you praying for the medicines to do its work? Are you praying for wisdom on which medicines to prescribe? Are you praying that God would give you wisdom as you diagnose things? If you're a real estate agent, are you praying for the families that are coming to you? And are you praying for that perfect house for them? Or are you just going about it thinking naturally like like a non-Christian would? Are you doing your vocation, no matter what you do, butcher, baker, candlestick maker, is there anything that makes how you do your vocation distinctively Christian? Are you doing it just like everyone else does it? And if that's the case, you've forgotten about the God of the miraculous and you're living in functional deism. Do you believe the Bible is the living and active Word of God? Do you believe it's supernatural? Well, one way to see if you're a functional deist is do you read this Word? Or do you just go about your day living in light of human reason than divine revelation? Yesterday, I had the privilege of helping uh, partake in the, the graduation of Westminster School at Oak Mountain. That's our Christian school here and across the street. And at the end of the service, I gave the benediction. And I tried to remind everybody, like I do to us periodically, that benediction is supernatural. Not because I'm special, but because God has promised to actually do that blessing as it's pronounced over you. That's what it says in number six. Do we minimize weekly worship? Do we minimize the benediction? Do we minimize the sacraments? Well, we've become functional deists. Jimmy Stewart, in a classic Western uh, called Shenandoah, gives a perfect uh, functional deism illustration. His wife, sadly, has uh, died, and he has a number of children, and he's trying to raise them as Christians like his wife wanted them to. And he gathers them around the dinner table. He's going to pray with them. Here's what he said. Now, your mother wanted all of you raised as good Christians, and I might not be able to do that thorny job as well as she could, but I can do a little something about your manners. Then he asks them all to bow their heads and fold their hands, and then he prays, Lord, we cleared this land, we plowed it, we sowed it, we harvested it, we cooked the harvest, we wouldn't be here, we wouldn't be eaten if we hadn't done all of it ourselves. We worked dog-boned hard for every crumb and morsel, but I guess we'll thank you just the same, Lord. That is functional deism. Living life as if it's all up to us. Are you doing that in your life today? We need to repent of that. We need to ask God in His grace to show us 
where we say we believe in the miraculous, but really are trusting in human reason more than divine revelation and trusting in human willpower rather than the power of God. But the waltz doesn't stop at repentance. We need to also go on to believe. What do we believe? We believe boldly in supernatural living. Look at verse 31. The church was walking in the comfort of the Holy Spirit and it multiplied. Now, many of our founding fathers denied the Trinity. John Adams said that he wouldn't believe the Trinity if God himself appeared and told him that it was true. That's typical of the attitude of many of our founding fathers. Now, we say we do believe in the Trinity, but how many of us deny the presence of the Spirit in our lives? How many of us live in as if sanctification, Christian transformation, was literally all about simply willpower applied to the idea of morality. Folks, that is not the Christian life. The Christian life is a supernatural life. What what makes Christianity unique is not our morals. You do understand that, right? Almost every religion has half-decent morality. Now, there are a few elements of Christianity that might make us unique, but if you're a Christian because of its morality, then you've missed Christianity. Christianity is Christian, first of all, because of Christ. He lived a life that we were called to live and failed to. And therefore, we owe God a debt that we could never pay. And Jesus came to pay that debt by giving his own blood. And Christianity is transferring our trust from our own works righteousness to the righteousness of Christ. That's Christianity. And when we trust in Christ, the Holy Spirit is poured out upon us and God begins transforming us supernaturally from the inside out. Now, how many of us say we believe that? and yet minimize the supernatural in our lives. Look, I know whom I am speaking with this morning. We're Presbyterians. We're the frozen chosen. Okay? We are doctrinally sound. In so many ways, if we're not careful, we can fall into the rationalism of many of our founding fathers. Look, we may be Presbyterian. But we need to recapture the emphasis on the supernatural in our lives. I'm a little bit of an outlier for our denomination. Many in our denomination are what do they call cessationists. And they believe that with the book of Acts and the finish of the book of Acts, that signs and wonders and miracles have ceased. That the only pur- purpose for the signs and wonders and miracles was to authenticate the truth of the gospel for the first century church. I don't believe that. I mean, I believe it did do that. But I believe God is still the God of miracles. I believe God is still the God of wonders. I believe God is still the God of signs. And I believe we're called to live supernatural lives. And I would submit to you this morning that Luke actually was inspired by God to write the book of Acts so that we would begin to expect more and more of the supernatural in our lives. Why do I say that? Because Luke records two miracles here in this passage before us that parallel miracles that Christ did. For instance, in verse 34, Peter comes to Aeneas, who is a paralytic, and he says, Jesus Christ heals you, rise and make your bed. Well, in the gospel of Luke, Jesus is in a house, and four friends bring their paralytic, paralyzed friend, and they can't get to Jesus, so they cut a hole in the roof. Remember this story? And they drop Jesus into the house, and Jesus speaks these very words, rise take your pallet and go home. Jesus taught the disciples to look for the supernatural in their lives, to believe boldly in supernatural living. And now Luke is recording history in the first century church, teaching us to believe boldly in the supernatural. In verse 40, 
Peter goes into the room, puts people out, turns to the body, and says, Tabitha, arise. In Luke chapter 8, Jairus' daughter is in a room. She has died. Jesus puts everybody out except for the father and a few of the disciples. And then he says in Aramaic, Talitha kum. If Peter was speaking Aramaic in this passage of ours, it would be the exact same phrase except for one letter. Jesus said, Talitha, little girl, arise. Kum. Peter says, Tabitha, kum. See, Jesus taught Peter well. Believe boldly in supernatural living. Luke is recording this pattern between Jesus and Peter to teach us, not just the first century church, but the 21st century church, that we're to believe boldly in supernatural living. Now look, I've not changed. I'm the same guy. I still don't believe in health, wealth, prosperity, theology. I don't believe that every time we pray for healing, we're going to see it. But I do believe that in our generation, and particularly in our churches, we are not trusting God for the supernatural the way that God means us to. Are you trusting God for anything supernatural right now? Is there a health issue that you're, you're going to doctors and getting help for, and you should? But are you trusting God to heal you? Is there an addiction you're wrestling with? You're seeing a counselor? You need to do that. That's wise. Maybe even taking some medication? That's smart. But are you trusting God to supernaturally heal you? You may have a child that is wayward. Or a child that's wrestling with deep sin. Are you praying for something supernatural to occur in their lives? In Acts 4 verse 30, the church prays for God to stretch out his hand and for healing and signs and wonders to occur. Do we do that? In verse 38, the disciples hearing that Peter was in Lydda and that Peter had healed Aeneas, they said, please come to us. See, they didn't stop with ancient CPR. They didn't stop with the warm water bath trying to get the blood to flow again. They said, Peter is in Lydda and he just healed Aeneas. Maybe he could heal Dorcas. Notice they washed the body, but they did not bury it. Why? Because they began to believe boldly in the supernatural. If God can heal a lame, paralyzed person, could he raise the dead? And then in verse 41, when Peter did raise Dorcas by the power of God from the dead, he calls the saints and the widows back into the room. Why does he do that? He wants them to see the supernatural. He's trying to inspire bold belief in the supernatural. And why do you think God inspires Luke to record the book of Acts? Because he's trying to inspire us in the 21st century to believe in the supernatural. I am so fearful that we have become a people of rational religion. We've become a people who simply believe Christianity is knowing right doctrine and doing right things. And we've lost the expectation and the hope of the truly supernatural in our lives. I have a dear friend. He's a dear friend to many of us in this church. He was chairman of the deacons in this church. And he's done maybe more in this church to, to, to elevate the role of mercy ministry in our church. His name is Rhett Tyler. Several years ago, Rhett Tyler was given a death sentence, literally. The doctors told him he had months. He, he began to, to lose feeling in his extremities. Uh, part of a finger actually had to be amputated because he was just... His body was was killing itself. His lungs, he was told, were going to shut down. 
He was actually told to prepare for, a, for an excruciating death. In James 5, it says, If any of them among you are sick, let them call upon the elders and let them anoint the sick with the oil of the Lord and pray in the name of Jesus, and the sick person will be made well. Well, if you're 815 or you know Rhett, you know he's still here. He's still having an impact for mercy. God healed him. Long before that, uh, there was an elder in our church named Jeff Fortson. He had a wonderful wife named Angie, and she was in a terrible car accident in Chelsea. I remember the church. It was very small at the time. We gathered outside of the trauma center, and I remember literally doctors coming out just wagging their heads. I remember doctor after doctor that we knew just, just like this, like, there's no hope. She was in a coma for months. The hospital had such little hope that they actually engaged in some negligence. They didn't even turn her body or help massage extremities. Well, Angie is very much alive. And unless you knew her before the accident, I would defy you to even be able to conclude that she's ever been in an accident. And the elders went up and prayed for her. We have seen healings in this church. Now, look, I don't know why God heals some and not all. Maybe for some of us, God simply wants us to experience the miracle of a changed life in the midst of suffering. That's miraculous too. But I think in our branch of the church, we are much too quick to run to that place. And I don't think we camp out long enough to say, God, heal. When Jesus and the Gospels went to Nazareth, his hometown, many of the people mocked him. Isn't this Jesus, the son of Mary and Joseph, a carpenter? Who's he think he is? And you know what the text says there? The text says he could not do many miracles there because of their unbelief. Okay. I hate that I even have to say this, but I want to be balanced. I'm a, I'm a teacher. I hate extremes I'm not saying name it claim it I'm not saying that what I am saying to this church is are we believing God for anything supernatural or are we really living as functional deists who say we believe in the miraculous but really don't the Christian life is supernatural. The most supernatural thing that's ever happened to a Christian is we've been raised from the dead already. We have a new heart. We have the Holy Spirit. And by God's miraculous power, we can say no to sin. We can say yes to righteousness. We can fight against the cultural stream of godlessness. We can see the miraculous in our day. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Do you believe that? And is it affecting your daily approach to life? Repent deeply of functional deism. Believe boldly in supernatural living. And then thirdly and finally, quickly, fight continually for kingdom presence. The, the reason why the miracles were performed by Christ was not just to reveal that he was God but also to realize that the kingdom of God was upon them. In Luke, verse t in Luke 10, verse 9, Jesus says to the disciples, Heal the sick, and as you do, say to them, The kingdom of God has come near you. The miraculous is supposed to be a sign to the church, but particularly to the world, that the kingdom of God is coming. The kingdom of God in heaven is breaking into earth. The power of the new Jerusalem, the power of the resurrected state is actually breaking in our world in the here and now. Look at verse 31 of our passage. So the church had peace. The Hebrew word for peace is shalom. 
The shalom of God refers to the well-being of, of his people, the fullness of life and health, the flourishing that God set up in the Garden of Eden. That is the shalom of God. And when Jesus rose from the dead, he actually inaugurated the beginnings of the kingdom of God. The Garden of Eden being restored actually begins to come to this world and death itself is working itself backwards because of the kingdom of God coming. As a matter of fact, look at verse 34. Luke is being very intentional, but more importantly, he's inspired by the Holy Spirit. And Peter said to Aeneas, get up. And the text says in verse 34, Aeneas rose. That's the same word Luke uses for the resurrection of Christ in the gospel. Look at verse 40. Peter turned to Tabitha and said, Tabitha, arise. That's the same word Luke uses in the gospel for the resurrection of Christ. The kingdom of God is the resurrected, restorative power of grace breaking into the here and now. And we we are to expect and pray and fight every day that the kingdom of God would come. Dorcas, Tabitha, by her engaging in acts of charity, that was the kingdom of God coming. And it would be miraculous in our day for Christians to say no to the God of this world, which is money, and practice surprising radical charity and generosity. And that would cause the kingdom of God to come. Then look at verse 35 and verse 42. The result of the power of the kingdom breaking into this world is that many turn to the Lord. In Lydda and Shine, they turn, Sharon, they turn to the Lord. And all throughout Joppa, many turned and looked to the Lord. God delights in revealing his kingdom power to bring the lost to faith in Christ. Maybe, just maybe, one of the reasons why we see such little miraculous power signs and wonders in our day is because we're really not concerned about the lost. We're not sharing our faith. We're not engaging every neighbor with the surprising power of grace. God delights to show the miraculous to the lost. He trusts that we believe it already. He delights in showing his power to the lost who don't believe it. Listen, the one place you'll see signs and wonders in our day is on the mission field. Okay, they're seeing it because they're bringing the gospel to the lost. Jesus is not a great watchmaker. He's a miracle worker. I'm not health, wealth, prosperity. I'm not name it, claim it, but I'm here to tell you, Jesus wants to do a miracle in your life today. Whether it's dealing with sin, whether it's loving your enemy, whether it's overcoming bitterness, whether it's recovering joy, whether it's gaining boldness to share your faith. Jesus wants to do a miracle in your life. Are you open to the fact that he's still that kind of a God? Next week, I invite you all to come back. We have a special guest speaker, uh, Micah McElveen, who is the founder of uh, Vapor Ministries. I'm on the board of Vapor. And Micah is actually going to share a literal miracle. Mike is going to share how he was raised from the dead. He's going to share other true miracles that vapor is seeing around the world, especially in Africa and Haiti. Aslan is on the move. The kingdom of God is coming. You don't need to be a charismatic Pentecostal to believe that. You can actually be Presbyterian and believe that. Let's pray. God, thank you for your word. Um, I don't understand it. I don't understand why everybody's not healed. And Lord, there are people here this morning that might be really frustrated by what I've just shared. They might be crying out, oh God, I have been trusting you for healing. How come it's not happening? Lord, I don't have that answer. But I know that you want us to trust you for the miraculous. And for those of us who know you, we thank you for the miracle of raising us from the dead already. 
And Lord, we thank you too for the miracle that one day everyone will be healed who knows Christ. Maybe you won't heal us from cancer this life, but we'll be healed in the new Jerusalem. Maybe you won't heal us from depression in this life, but we will one day be healed. Maybe you won't heal our child's waywardness, but one day, we trust, they'll repent. And so, Lord, may we be a people that, that hold to the Scriptures accurately, but God, keep us from putting you in a box. Keep us from putting limitations on you that your Word doesn't. And God, would you open our eyes to the miraculous all around us every day. God, if there's anybody here who doesn't know Jesus, we pray that today would be the day they transfer their trust from their own works righteousness to the finished work of Christ. We ask all this in Jesus' name.